Please give a warm Georgia Tech welcome to our speaker, Diana Rivenberg. Thank you, Matt. I went into my local Starbucks a little while ago, and I handed my reusable coffee mug to my favorite barista, Miguel. And as he was filling it, my order is really boring. It's decaf with room. I, I looked around, and I was noticing lots of things about Starbucks. The art on the wall from local artists, the fair trade and organic coffees, the ethos water bottles that talk about how Starbucks sends clean drinking water, provides clean drinking water to children around the world, the bin where you can donate coffee to troops, the students who are studying, the business meetings that are taking place. And it just struck me that coffee shops have changed dramatically since the days of brew and serve. A company like Starbucks now has to worry about things like, are their cups recyclable? Are they made from recycled materials? Will the lids leak toxins? Are they securely sealed so that they won't burn the customers? How are their beans grown? What are the agricultural practices used? How much water do they use? Where does that water come from? How are the laborers housed? What are their working conditions? How are they paid? Was the wildlife disturbed? I mean, the Rainforest Alliance alone has more than 100 criteria that they have to adhere to. So Starbucks doesn't just serve coffee. Starbucks serves the world. But they make money doing it. And what Starbucks is dealing with is what all of us are dealing with. Sustainability has transformed the way we work and live. And it has do is doing it in a way that will be as transformational as we saw in the industrial age and in the information age. And smart companies get this. They understand that they have to transform the way they do business. And in order to transform the way they do business, they also have to transform their cultures. Ray Anderson, Georgia Tech, class of 1956. Many of you here may know the story of Ray Anderson and the company he founded in the 70s, Interface Carpets. But it's worth repeating because it's very relevant to our topic of sustainability and culture. Ray had an epiphany in 1994 when he read a book by Paul Hawkins called The Ecology of Commerce. And Ray thought about what this carpet company that he had so proudly grown over the past 20 years was doing to the environment. And he decided he needed to make a change. So Ray challenged his team at Interface to go from being this petrochemical, fossil fuel-based carpet company into becoming an ecology leader. Carpet company, ecology leader. Right. When you throw a carpet into a landfill, it probably stays there for about 8 billion years. It just doesn't go anywhere. It just, toxins just go into the environment. And this was 1994. So for those doing the math, it was 17 years ago, if my math is right. So this was a huge thing to transform this company. And Ray knew that he would need the efforts of every single person at Interface to make this happen. He knew that he did not just need to rethink all of his operations and his supply chain, but he needed to rethink his culture. So you will leave here today understanding not just how important culture is to sustainability and to business, but also three key ways to transform that culture. And they are to lead, to engage, and to align. Now it all starts with leadership. The first point is that leaders need to get it. I had the opportunity to sit on that side of the, of the stage during an impact series last year when Mike Duke was speaking. 
Mike Duke, Georgia Tech class of 1972, I believe, is the CEO of Walmart. All right, I know you all know Walmart. They're the company that has the biggest stores in the smallest cities across America. They are also the biggest company in the world. I think their revenues are closing in on $500 billion right now. And I think they were recently ranked as the 20th largest economy in the world. So they're larger than most countries. Yet Mike Duke stood on this stage and he talked about four next generation goals for Walmart. And the fourth one, he said, was most important. And that was to keep the Walmart culture strong. That a strong culture was what they needed to move the company forward. Mike Duke gets it. Second is to envision it. Ray Anderson had a vision for his company. But he also had a vision for his culture. He knew that to get the company where he wanted it to go, he would have to have certain key aspects in his culture, like innovation like the ability to change, like engagement, like collaboration. All right, so Ray Anderson could see it, say it. John Brock, chairman and CEO of Coca-Cola Enterprises, told me that they talk about sustainability in every key company message. And it's not just about the critical messages, the formal messages that goes out. It's also about the informal conversation that goes on and in the decisions that are made. John Brock, Georgia Tech, class of 1970 and 1971 for his masters. John Brock says it. Show it. When you walk around Georgia Tech, you see signs of sustainability and your commitment to sustainability everywhere. Whether it be through recycling bins, what you see in your food services, uh, composting, sustainable transportation, LEED certified buildings. There are signs of it everywhere. Okay? Leaders need to make sure that the signs are out there, that the symbols of sustainability are everywhere to get it into the culture. But now, President Peterson is not the only leader at Georgia Tech. Mrs. Peterson, are you here? Oh, okay, Val. I had the chance to talk to Mrs. Peterson. And it's interesting, when I talked to Dr. Peterson and I asked him if he would be willing to be interviewed for my book, he said, oh, absolutely. We're doing some great things here at Georgia Tech. I'd be happy to tell you about those. He says, but you also need to interview Val, because she knows a lot and she's doing a lot. So leadership doesn't just come from the top. Leadership comes from all levels throughout an organization. All of us have an impact on culture and an impact on results. And we all need to act as leaders and catalysts. That brings me to our next point, And that's engagement. And here we're talking about employee engagement or engagement of students, right, the key people within an organization. So to explain en engagement, I'm going to ask you to think about a time when you were really invested in an organization. It could be in a job with a company, it could be in, with a school, it could be in a religious organization, on a team, a member of the band. But I want you to think about a specific time right now where you were really invested in that organization, where you were willing to go above and beyond, bring your very best efforts every day because you wanted to. Okay, now I want you to tell the person next to you what company that was or what organization that was that you had in mind. You thought that was a rhetorical question, didn't you? <laughs> Michael, it was Georgia Tech, right? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Okay, now, with that organization and that role in mind, I'm going to ask you to answer these four questions. When you were really invested and involved in this organization, did you feel really motivated? Absolutely, okay. Were you learning? Were you learning new things? Were you developing? Right. Were you seeking ways to learn? 
Were you creative and innovative? Did you try to find ways to do things better and solve problems around you? Were you productive, effective, efficient in getting things done? If you could answer yes to these questions, then you know what it feels like to be highly engaged. And that's what you want in an organization. That's what you want in a workforce. That's what you want in a university. That's what you want to see, highly engaged people. Okay. So I'm going to use one of my clients to illustrate how you go about getting people engaged. Nova Nordisk is a Danish-based pharmaceutical company. And their US operations are here in North Carolina. And they primarily focus on diabetes, but they also uh, pr create products for other disease states like hemophilia and growth hormone. And Nova Nordisk is recognized as a global sustainability leader. They take sustainability seriously. They also take culture seriously. They have these auditors that they call facilitators that audit their culture. They go from site to site to see what's going on in the culture. They interview employees, and they interview their managers, and they observe things that are going on. And they look at different results, like their engagement surveys. And they hold their, account, their managers, their leaders, accountable for transforming that culture, for getting that culture to the, be the best it can be in certain key areas, and to keep it there and keep growing it. They hold them very accountable for that. So here's what Nova Nordisk does. And in key dri these are key drivers of engagement. Now, you should know what drives engagement in your company or in your organization. Because it, is, it does vary somewhat from company to company. And it also varies from job to job. Um, in fact, at Coca-Cola Enterprises, John Brock told me that their number one driver of employee engagement is leadership. Their second driver of employee engagement is sustainability. Sustainability drives engagement in tremendous ways. And it does it primarily because people feel that their work is meaningful. Okay. At Nova Nordisk, everyone I talk to, whether it's the senior leadership on down to the plant employees or people that I run into in the cafeteria, will tell me that they know that their work makes a difference. What they do makes a difference to the lives of people with diabetes. If you were to go to their North Carolina plant, they have this huge long hallway that they call the Blue Mile, because one wall is painted this vibrant shade of blue, similar to that. And on the, the Blue Mile, you would see these large photos of people and a brief description underneath of their story of how the company's products have transformed their lives, have helped them to better manage their disease and to live better lives. And what's more impactful than seeing those stories and photos on the wall is knowing that each and every one of those people are a family member or a friend of someone who works in that plant. So the people at Nova Nordis know that they make a difference, that they have meaningful work. Tied to that, they know the connection to the bigger picture. If you were to continue walking around the plant, you would see these large whiteboards posted in every key functional area in the plant operations. And these whiteboards have these charts on them with their key performance indicators, their KPIs. And every day, every employee on every shift walks those boards with their managers. And they understand where they stand, where they need to go, what the priorities are for that day, and they discuss possibilities. It's a two-way conversation. They know how what they will do that day feeds into that larger picture. Strong and trusted leaders is the third key driver of employee engagement. When I talk to people at Nova Nordisk, they rave about their senior leader. They know that he is committed to having this plant, their operations do the be, be the best that they can be. They know that he believes in them, that he will engage them, he will involve them in things that are going on. He has the experience and the competence to make it happen. And he will build a strong team to make that happen. They know that they have a strong and trusted leader. And the fourth is ongoing learning and development. 
Nova Nordisk has a fabulous training and organization development department, but they don't stop there. They'll also bring in external resources, such as, as strategic imperatives, to come in and to help them to develop their leadership, to develop their employees. So four key drivers of engagement. These are the key drivers that we see consistently across the research. So now, if we know what drives engagement, then how do we get there? Right. Alignment is the third key. Because you need to align the design. Your organization is perfectly designed to get the results you're getting. So if you want to change those results, you need to change how your organization's designed. Now, organization design isn't about moving the boxes around on the org chart. I one time told a CEO that I was working with that it's more than about you and Bob sitting down at the Marriott on the back of a napkin over a beer drawing boxes. Okay? We need to look at this in a more focused way. Right? Organization design is about looking at all the systems and processes and management practices in the, in the company and aligning that to your strategy, aligning that to your culture. You can think of these management practices as levers. So pulling each of those levers is going to give you leverage for change. So I'm going to talk about just a few of them so that you get a sense of, of what we mean. Communication. If sustainability is important to you and you want that to be part of your culture, you talk about it all the time. And the conversations are two-way. So your communication practices, how often, in what ways, to whom. Investments in compensation. It's about where you put your money. Are you putting resources towards things that you say are important? Are you, are you putting people there? Are you spending time there? Are you putting the equipment there that you need? And it's also about where you're investing money in people's pockets, in their paycheck. So your incentive plans need to be lined up. Your bonus plans, your performance management systems need to be aligned so that you are rewarding the right behaviors and the right results. Your systems and processes. If you're committed to sustainability, you're going to be measuring things that you never thought of measuring before. So things like your water use, your energy use, your waste management. How are you reducing waste? Could be things on, in your supply chain that you're measuring. Well, they all have to be worked into your systems and processes. And you need to have systems and processes that help align and help people to get work done, not get in the way. And sometimes systems, systems and processes do that. They do get in the way. Right. People practices. Take a look at who you hire, who you promote, your training programs, your orientation programs, your performance management systems, all of your people practices, your HR policies. Are they focused in a way that promotes the kind of culture you want and that will help to, you to get sustainability embedded into your organization? <coughs> Governance and decision making. Very, very important. John Brock told me that only 19% of Fortune 500 companies have sustainability committees at the board of director levels. And in his opinion, he said, if you're serious about sustainability, every single one of these companies needs to have a board committee for sustainability. It's not enough to turn things over to the green teams. They're important for initiatives, for lo to be local catalysts, they're critical. You need to have it all up and down your operation where you have people that are focused on sustainability. But it also needs to be throughout your organization. It needs to be viewed as everyone's job. And that's one of the d dangers of having uh, a chief sustainability officer, say, in a company. And I know at, at CCE, Coca-Cola Enterprises, they don't have a chief sustainability officer because they view it as being everyone's job. But I also see a friend in the audience who once was in that role. And she told me something that I thought was really interesting, that she fought not to have an empire under her. Because she did not want to be seen, and she did want, not want her department to be seen as the people responsible for that. She fought 
to make sure that that was embedded throughout the organization and to give that impression. So it is about how you design your organization. And different companies do it in different ways. However, you need to align your design, all these systems, management, practices, processes, to get the culture that you want. If they're not aligned, you won't get there. You'll keep getting the results you are getting. So three keys to culture change. Lead, engage, align. I was trying to make them into a cute acronym, but it really wasn't working. All right, let me tell you a little story. Earlier this year, I was invited by the Prince of Wales and Cambridge to attend a business and sustainability program at St. James Palace, which was pretty cool. So I got to meet Prince Charles, His Royal Highness, or HRH. He's the dude on the right. I'm the one he's pointing at. I'm wearing my sustainability suit, obviously. <laughs> so in conversations with Prince Charles, I knew you were awake. <laughs> in conversations with Prince Charles, he said, America needs to step up. The United States needs to step up and take greater leadership in sustainability. There's too much of this nonsense politics getting in the way. America needs to be a leader. And they need to do it fast. And they need to do it in a, in a, in a significant way. And he said to me, you know, I think I'll talk to my friend Mike Duke about doing more in a sustainable agriculture. Mike Duke, Georgia Tech, class of 1972. Okay. Prince Charles wants Mike Duke to help him save the world. That's cool, isn't it? Yeah, I think so. So I said, Mike Duke, he went to Georgia Tech. I said, hey, you know people. You can make this happen. And he agreed. He knew people. So lead, engage and align are the three keys that I want to leave you with. But first, before we close, I want to ask if there are questions or comments that I might be able to answer or respond to. Yes. OK. Do we have to wait for a microphone? Thank you. Okay. How did you get your, cult, your passion for sustainability? Oh, I guess I had a little bit of an epiphany myself. I, um, Started my first consulting practice 10 years ago. And it was focused on strategy, leadership, and organization development, organizational change. And I was working with companies that were very socially responsible or were in a space that provided social good, like, like healthcare. And I decided I wanted to go back and get my master's. And I debated for years about what I would go back for. And I found this great program at Case Western Reserve University that integrated sustainability into the program. And, as I, and I thought, well, that was kind of a nice thing. I, I liked that about the program. But I wasn't quite sure how much that might impact my business. Well, as I went through some of the classes on sustainability and the way it was integrated into things like strategy and organizational change, and started to do some research with some great companies like UPS right here in Atlanta, I, I just sort of had this little epiphany that said, wow, you know, there are all these companies out there doing all these green things, these sustainability projects. But they're not tying these technical aspects to the organization. They're not matching up the organization design or the culture. They're kind of leading it a little bit separately. They really can't get the impact out of it unless they pull it in. So they were struggling with that. And I thought, well, I know that. I can do that. And I'm already doing it. We just weren't using the S word. I've been doing it for years. But if I had said, oh, well, that's, that's sustainability that we're putting into your strategy, my clients would have looked at me like I was a tree hugger. But they were doing it. So I, the more I learned, the more passionate I became. But my, my father, he's up there right now laughing at me. Because I was the girl walking around, leaving all the lights on and running the water and you know, using a fan outside when I was suntanning. But yeah, I know. I know. I'm making up for that. <laughs> Another question? I'm oh, sorry. When you think of sustainability in terms of a company, uh, does it have conflicts with uh, innovation? I'm sorry, can you say uh, that? Does sustainability have conflicts with innovation? Conflicts with innovation? Yeah. Oh, on the contrary. I think that, if I, if I understand your, correct, your question correctly, does sustainability conflict with innovation? I think that innovation drives sustainability. And sustainability, thinking about that, and thinking about new ways of doing things, 
drives innovation in a huge way. Where companies are figuring out how do they find new ways to make money or save money or create new products or services or enter new markets, the innovations are thriving. In fact, there was a Harvard Business Review article, I think in September 2009, where it called sustainability the mother load of innovation, that we will see tremendous innovation over the next couple of decades because of this. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Um, I have two, it's like a two-part question. The first okay. is, do you see sustainability as the new frontier, um, mm -hmm. somewhat like the internet, but more or less as the next, um, I guess, explosion of innovation companies and whatnot? And mm -hmm. then also, how do you see social entrepreneurs playing a role in sustainability in the next 20 or 30 years? Hmm. Okay. Uh, first, I do see sustainability as being a new frontier. And I see it as, I, I don't know that I would compare it to the internet, but it is more like the information age, where, all right, I know some of you don't remember this, but my first, the first laptop, that portable laptop that I got to take home to do work, took me two trips to get it from the car. And I'm not that old, you know. So, in, so innovation, technology is changing rapidly. And that's going to change, or uh, really propel the pace of sustainability forward even faster. The way we live and work now is going to be tremendously different in the next 10 to 20 years. And your second question was about social entrepreneurs. I think they play a huge part in this. I mean, uh, I saw Mohammed Yunus, Nobel Peace Prize winner and founder of the Grameen Bank, speak here at the Impact Series. He was your kickoff speecher, speaker last year. I'm your kickoff speaker this year. Okay. But Mohammed Yunus was great. So he was this assistant professor in Bangladesh, kind of coming up with this you know, great story about starting this bank for the poor. And so social entrepreneurs will find these opportunities, will find these ways where they can bring social good in a way that they can also make money off of it. Okay. Hi. Yeah. Okay. So kind of playing off of his earlier question, what do you think is the future of sustainability for institutions such as Georgia Tech who have already made great strides in cementing it into the culture? Hmm. I think, you know, there are some great stories out there. And one of the, you know, I, I often refer to the research on my book as going through a second master's without having to write the big check to go along with it. But as, as great as those stories are, even the leaders in sustainability, whether they be universities or corporations or social enterprises, will say, we are just scratching the surface. We don't, even, we don't know what we don't know yet. You know, Ray Anderson, one of his famous quotes was that leaders need to see around the bend. We don't know what's about around the bend, but we need to try and figure out what those possibilities might be and work towards them. And some of them will hit and some of them won't. But I think there'll be tremendous innovations around uh, how, we, how we use resources in our environment. I think water is a critical issue worldwide, not just, you know, in places like Georgia. Okay? But water is a tremendous area where work is being done. I think um, sustainable agriculture is a, is a tremendous focus. Walmart is making sustainable agri agriculture one of their key focus areas. And I think things are happening up and down the supply chain for all organizations. Universities are doing a great job at integrating sustainability into the curriculum, into your buildings and your operations. Uh, uh, Georgia Tech is a signatory for the American College and University President's Climate Commitment the ACU PCC, and there are over 700 colleges and universities that have signed on to that commitment. And it's about transforming the way you run this university and the way you learn in this university and what you learn. Okay. Hi, your uh, alignment slide, the second block down, talked about uh, compensation yes. and uh, investment. Mm -hmm. What do you say to your clients in the current economic climate about that? It, with, with facing prolonged recession, how do you have? How do you suggest that they find the find mm -hmm. the money to make uh, mm -hmm. bonus plans and such? Oh, that's a great question. Uh, in fact, um, one of the things that John Brock said to me was that when people are finding ways to save energy and save resources and operate more efficiently, they're finding the money because they're making money by doing this. Now, sometimes they may need to make an investment up front to get that return on investment. But there are, those companies that started early on before this recession have said that that is one of the things, sustainability is one of the key things that has helped them to get through this time period 
in a way because they're operating more efficiently. They're operating more effectively. They have engaged people throughout their organization and they've engaged people up and down their, their value chain from the supply chain right on through to the consumer and beyond. So they are, um, let me give you a couple of examples where employee ideas have saved the company money. Uh, Herman Miller, maker of high-end office furniture. They achieved their goal of becoming 100%, of using 100% renewable energy in their operations, which was an aspirational goal that they had no idea how they would achieve. Well, they got there, and they got there 10 years early. But they got there through employee suggestions. Right? So they did not invest any more to get there 10 years earlier in outside energy experts. But their employees just kept thinking and thinking of ideas, and they got there earlier. Our Interface has saved more than $438 million on waste reduction alone solely through employee suggestions. That's 41% of the waste that they currently get rid of. I mean, that's a heck of a return on investment on a, on a suggestion box. It's just, it's a really good deal. Um, so there, I, uh, there was one manager in a North Carolina Walmart store. I like this story. It, and he asked if it would be okay if they took the light bulbs out of, uh, Natalie, you remember this story because I think you were interviewing Matt Kinsler at the time. And they were um, taking, he asked if they could take the light bulbs out of the vending machines in the break rooms at the store. So it wasn't where the customers would see it, but it was inside the break rooms. And they said, yeah, that's okay. And then the bean counters back in Bentonville started to do some calculations. Well, they figured that if all their stores did that, they would save $1.4 million a year. Uh, yeah, I know they have a lot of stores, but it's still, it's one employee, one idea, you know, saving the planet, you know, one little light bulb at a time. It's, so, you know, these are things, there are many, many ways. There is this great trade-off myth that still is out there, that to go green, you're going to spend more green. And yeah, sometimes you have to make an investment, but boy, does it pay off when you make the right ones. And there's so much low-hanging fruit before you have to do that. Fred, do we have a mic over here? Or? I have it. Um, I was wondering, do you think there's anything as students that we should be doing now to improve sustainability besides waiting until we get into the workforce? Oh, yeah. Oh, President Peterson's going to be so glad you asked that question. <laughs> yeah, there is, a gr there is so much going on here at Georgia Tech that's wonderful. Um, I, I had the chance to talk to Marsha Kinsler, who's our you know, Director of Sustainability, and she was telling me about the many, many uh, initiatives that are going on at Georgia Tech. There is such a great need to engage students in activities on this campus that uh, you wouldn't even believe what exists right now, let alone what can exist in the future. So there is, it, not only is that an opportunity for you to do something and make a difference now, it's also a great experience as you go forward into the, into the work world. Because you can say, hey, here's how I made a difference as a student. Here are the groups that I led. Here are the things I was involved in. But it, sustainability on campus is about all, how many students do you have here at Georgia Tech? Anyone know? About 20,000? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a lot of people making a difference. Huh. Okay, I think we had a question up here. Or? Okay. Um, kind of going off uh, the previous question, uh, we've talked a lot about the role of sustainability in businesses. Yes. What do you see the role of sustainability for small governments, such as I see that you have the city of Decatur on here that you've worked mm -hmm. with. So what do you tell small governments like that? Oh, okay. Uh, the city of Decatur was great to work with. The, I mean, I love Decatur. Um, and they were doing this visioning summit in preparation for the strategic planning. And so they pulled all their city managers together. And what we asked them to do, and we facilitated this two-day two -day session, was to come up with all these great ideas and possibilities for how they could operate as a highly sustainable city, considering social issues, economic issues and environmental issues. And we had the walls plastered with ideas. And then they broke them down into key categories and decided which were their high priorities. All right. So ideas came from all over the place. And they had to figure out, all right, which ones are we going to be able to do right now? And which ones are we going to make incremental progress over the long term? So it does vary city by city. But waste management is one area. I know social, social um, services, education is another one. Um, any, kind of, uh, any kind of building, you know, the way bu building and transportation goes on in their communities. But there are, if you can just kind of like Google the top 10 sustainable cities 
in the country, you'll find out what, what some of their key practices are. And in fact, uh, Mayor Reed has set a goal that he wants Atlanta to be in the top 10 sustainable cities. <laughs> Did somebody just chuckle? <laughs> you? All right. <laughs> Oh, come on, you need to be part of the solution here. There's 20,000 people right here that can make Atlanta sustainable. Okay. okay. They're looking for a sustainability director, if you're interested. <laughs> Knowing the um, economic and environmental benefits that come from this, what are the biggest challenges you see? If we know that employee engagement, we know that the financial choices, is it strictly a financial impediment, or are there other challenges that you're running into to embed this into cultures and into businesses? Uh, what are the key challenges to get it into culture, Fred? Yeah. Um, I think the first challenge is to get leaders to get it. All right? If they understand, and they really understand, that sustainability is a key part of their business, and it's not just something that you staple to the back of the business plan, that's the first step. They really need to buy into that. And sometimes you need to show them the returns and show them the progress before they say, what else you got? <laughs> Give me some more. And then they also need to understand how culture drives that. And now most leaders, right, especially you know, senior leaders or, or any kind of leaders, they, they came up through the ranks. So they might have been you know, the CFO before they became the CEO, or maybe they came up through you know, the operations part of the organization. But they're experts in what they've done for decades. They're not experts in organization design or culture change. So they need some help from people on laying out a plan in a way that's simple for them to grasp and see the possibilities around that. And I think you can also change, or I know, you can also change culture while you're doing things. So for example, while you're engaging people and the ways that you're engaging people, you are changing culture. One of the, one of the great stories that came out of my conversation with Dr. Peterson was about this and this huge summit that you, you held here at Georgia Tech before creating the strategic plan. And I think he said there were about 700 people who had attended. So it was open to the public, it was open to students, faculty members, alumni, and anyone who just really wanted to come. And when he proposed that, people thought he was nuts. Like, how are we going to keep 700 people and conversations going? But he said they got such rich ideas out of that. So when you engage people in the dialogue and you get them involved, sometimes it just gets a life of its own and starts to take off. But you also have to make sure that you're doing the things that you need to do as a corporation, like aligning your incentive plans and hiring practices to make sure that you're not kind of stalling that momentum. Other questions? Yes. From an engineering or manufacturing background, mm -hmm. um, how important do you think Lean Six Sigma initiatives are in the sustainability of a company? Yeah, there, there are some companies, um, like I know Nova Nordisk does a lot in lean manufacturing, that just swear by it and say, you know what, this is really important to our operation. And I think um, it helps you become efficient and effective. I think you can combine the Six Sigma and lean practices with some other practices for engaging people. Um, there's some good practices out there around appreciative inquiry, for example, which can, can engage large groups. So it's not just let's follow the rules for Six Sigma, but let's really engage people and, and tie multiple practices together. And there are other companies where you know, Six Sigma would be spit out like it was a bad organ because it just doesn't fit their culture. Um, I was uh, talking to someone who's a director of sustainability at um, Levi Strauss, and their cultures are about creativity. Yeah, so Six Sigma probably wouldn't be the route that they would go. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Do you see the cost of being sustainable going down in the future so that maybe more small-scale companies will be able to survive being green and, well, more companies will enter the market? Oh, yes. Um, well, first of all, I think that, again, let's, let's take a look at that trade-off myth and question that. Because there are, if you can look around you in any organization, you'll find some low-hanging fruit, some things that you can do right away to say, wow, I can't believe we're wasting money on that. And the more you get people engaged, the more they'll, they'll find other ideas. And these things can help finance some of the bigger things. And it's also helpful to understand 
what else might be out there to help you, like tax credits or financing schemes that can help you with, let's say, changing over your energy. But there was a part of your question that was about, are the costs going to come down for some of these like higher cost things, I'm assuming you mean? And I think absolutely yes. I mean, we see that in innovation of all kind. I mean, I remember you know, my, the first VCRs that came out that cost like, I don't know, $1,200. You, know, you wouldn't use one of those as a doorstop now. You know, GPS you can get for under 100 bucks. You know, my first one was a really good deal at about $1,100. So, you know, so technology, yeah, it was, and it was portable. It wasn't even the one built in the car. But the te price of technology comes down rapidly. And if you can take a look at a return on investment, like the cost of green building, there's a, does anybody here know the gap, like now, the cost of building a conventional building versus the cost of building, like, a green building and where that might be? Any experts in our audience that know that? All right, well, the gap is closing rapidly. So it, it, sometimes it, when people do the numbers and they say, well, it's going to cost me you know, X dollars more to build a green building or a LEED certified building, but I'm going to get that payback in just a few years, and then I'm going to continue to make that money back, that's a great investment. I mean, you look at the things we spend money on now. You know, how much marble do you want to stick in the lobby of the building or you know, the, the kinds of furniture that you're buying? Well, just think about them differently and look for different alternatives. And some of those you'll find are far more cost effective. Uh, I have actually two questions, and uh, okay. the last one will be a good one. But the, uh, the, <laughs> the first one is, you know, we talk about innovation and sustainability, and a lot of that is creating new things. But right. a lot of a sustainable um, community involves undoing perverse priorities and making changes that are a whole lot harder than bringing in new things. Mm -hmm. How do you alter you know, creating a new, it's one thing to create a new sustainable company, but how do you transform an organization or a community that has these perverse subsidies? Hmm. Gee, does that ever happen? <laughs> yes, it, it, that is a big issue. Um, it, when you take a look at any kind of change that you want to create, the first thing that needs to change are the mindsets of people. And uh, Jim Hartsfeld, who runs Interface Rays, has called this the 100 doors of sustainability, where he says you never know quite what door you need to open up for someone to walk through before they're going to buy into that change or buy into that, to that concept. So the very, very first thing is for people to start seeing things differently. True change and true commitment to sustainability or any kind of key strategy really comes when you engage the heart and the mind. So you do have to educate people about the logic and the reasons why you can do this and how you can do this, but they have to feel something about it. It has to feel important for them, for them to truly be engaged and for, to truly move forward. And in fact, the Chinese use the same word to describe the heart and the mind. They see them as highly integrated. My uh, next uh, question is um, sometimes I get irritated with people who don't get the sustainability stuff. And so I would like you to sort of imagine mm -hmm. and t tell us a story about um, how sustainability becomes institutionalized so that it's just a way of life that we are not talking about sustainable practices, that we just mm -hmm. essentially have a balance with economic, mm -hmm. social, and environmental uh, value creation. Right. Um, I think Interface is a good story of a company that is, they, when, they, when I ask somebody at Interface, well, how are you getting it into your culture? She says, we're not getting it in there. It's already there. It is part of everything we do. So just like you think about you know, the, the customer experience in something or the financials or safety issues or quality issues, it's just one of those things that they think of. But it starts with shifting how they think about their business. And they had to shift their thinking in a very dramatic way. So it, it, one, of my, uh, one of my professors at Case Western sort of describes what's going on now in sustainability as a hockey stick. And he says, you know what, the, the economy kind of dipped and the interest went down a bit for people who weren't fully there. But we're going to hit this tipping point. We're, Businesses and, and other organizations are really going to get this. 
and it's just going to start shooting up because they're going to get it. They're going to get how important it is to their business and the technology and the innovation is going to make it much more cost effective. Yeah. yeah. Um, given that the United States kind of has an obligation to uh, like leave a positive impact on the world, mm -hmm. um, do you think we're kind of like behind on par or like ahead of uh, leading the world in sustainability? I think there are some wonderful things coming out of the United States, but I also fear that uh, discussions about sustainability, discussions about the environment and social issues have become far too political. Sustainability is not about what political party you belong to. It's really the right thing to do. It's good for our country. It's good for business. It's good for our lives. So I think people need to get their, their heads around that and their hearts into it and figure out a way to make this happen. And, I, and I'm a bit concerned because of the political infighting that's going on. I mean, it always goes on. But it's going on to a higher degree right now. And you know, so this is not the charge of you know, those left-wing tree-hugging liberals. This is something that's also really good for business. So I, I think that's one of the key reasons why business and industry has to lead the way. Not only are they, do they make up 50% of the world's largest economies, but they have, the, they have the manpower to do it. They have the resources. They have the thinking. They have the innovation. You know, they have money to invest, and they can benefit from it. So I think when, when companies lead the way, government follows. But government has a role to play in that. And yes, I do think the United States has a lot more to do, and there's a lot more we can do. And let's face it, you folks are the next leaders. So you'll have some good ideas coming out of Georgia Tech. Other questions? Diana, do you have some final comments you'd like to make? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, I had the opportunity to talk to President Peterson uh, as part of the research for the book. And one of the comments that he made to me was that Georgia Tech was not just about providing great education to its students, but it was also about developing people that could think critically, that could find innovative solutions to complex problems, and that could become global leaders or become entrepreneurs that will go out there and start those businesses that will lead the way. So, it's not so much about what you've heard here, but what you do with that tomorrow. And you know, I'd ask you to think about how you want to go forward and lead and engage and align others in ways that you can make a difference. And those decisions are yours. Thanks for coming to Georgia Tech today. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, Alan.